All right. Good to see everyone out this morning. Good morning, brother. Good morning. good morning, friends. Good to see everyone. We've had a good Bible study, good worship service. Thank you, Jackie, for those songs. Nolan, for that well-worded prayer. Brock, for the scripture reading. It's been, I don't know. You missed a Sunday morning. You just seem like you've been gone forever. That's Roy back there saying he just pulled in. It's like he's at a strange place. Sometimes you get that feeling. But we're all welcome here. We're not strangers here. And it's good to be in Christ. It's good to be a Christian this day as we're gathered here today. In the spring of 2010, an accident took the life of Tara Storch's 13-year-old daughter, Taylor. What followed was a, a terrible thing that followed that, the, the, the severity of that. It's every mom and dad's worst nightmare, the, the uh, funeral and, and the burial. And then there were, of course, the avalanche of questions of, of why and, and, and all the grief as they, as they mourned for their daughter. And somehow in the midst of all of that, though, they found the composure, they found the presence of mind and the compassion of heart during that tragedy to donate her vital organs. Nobody at that time probably needed a heart more than a woman by the name of Patricia Winters. Mrs. Winters' heart had began to debilitate to the point now for the last five years that she could not even get out of bed. All she could do was sleep. And nobody needed a transplant worse than she did. But Taylor's 13-year-old heart would give her that new lease on life. Taylor's mother had one request that she would be able to hear the heart of her daughter. And any, whoever received the heart of her daughter, she wanted to hear her daughter's heart again. So she flew from Dallas to Phoenix to meet Miss Winters. And when they met each other, they embraced for a good long time. And then Miss Winters took a stethoscope and said, would you like to hear the heart of your daughter? Now, she took the stethoscope, and I guess the question I have for us this morning is that when she did that, and she, she heard the heart beating, whose heart did she hear? Well, she heard the heart of her daughter. She, it was beating in somebody else's body, but she heard the heart of her daughter. And so there's a question, or there's a song, there's a hymn, we don't sing it much, but there's a song that says, listen to our hearts, words cannot express. And when God does that, when God listens to our heart, I guess the question is, does he not want to hear the heart of his son beating in you? Paul would say to the Galatian brethren in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, it is not I who live, I no longer live, but Jesus Christ lives in me. He would say to the Colossians brethren, chapter 1, verse 27, he would say this, Christ is in you. He is the hope, he says, or the very hope of glory. The only way that that's possible is through the amazing grace of God. Now, I think that we use the grace, the word grace, kind of casually in our life. I, 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 you know, you think about it, banks give a grace period. Uh, if you're an athlete, you're said to be graceful. Uh, the guy that is uh, very uh, humble is said to be gracious. Composers have a grace note. Uh, we name little girls Grace. Hi, uh, Gracie. How you doing back there? And, and before our meals, a lot of times, we'll have somebody say grace. We use grace in, in casual terms a lot. But grace, I believe, as the scripture teaches, is so much more than that. Grace is God Almighty making the decision to love you, to redeem you, to restore you, to make you his own. That's what grace is. And I think that's what the prophet Ezekiel would say when he would say in chapter 36, I will give you a new heart. I will put in you a new spirit within you. Now, in order to do that, but in order for that to happen, I think the greatest expression of grace, the greatest expression of kindness, the greatest expression of love was going to have to take place, and all of it was going to have to be totally deserved on our part. We don't have uh, before any of that could take place. That was going to have to happen. John would write, chapter 1, verse 14. The Word, he talks about Jesus, which is Jesus Christ, became flesh. 
it dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. He is full of grace and truth. Look at verse 16. We have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth are ours through Jesus the Christ. Now, we wouldn't say it that way, grace for grace. That's a Hebrewism. And what that means is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, piled upon grace, piled upon grace. That's what grace for grace means. That's what it is. There are statements in this passage, though, that I want you to look at. The Lord was, it says, is full of grace. When somebody's full of kindness, they exuberate kindness. When somebody's full of joy, is that, that's what they have. They, they have that. They're joyful. You can see that. They radiate joy. Jesus was full of grace. And so he radiated that kind of grace. He offered grace of compassion when he discussed and forgave the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. He was full of grace or he offered the grace of his presence when he ate with sinners and tax collectors. He offered his grace of compassion when he healed numerous people. The compassion was there. And he offered the grace of salvation to a lost world that was ruined by sin. He offered this grace of salvation. And so he was full of grace. He offered grace upon grace upon grace. The fact that God's grace is not merely a one-time event that takes place. We need to recognize that fact. Once you obey the gospel, when you hit the waters of baptism, you have the forgiveness of sins. That is critically important. But you need to remember that God's grace continues to forgive us, it continues to bless us, and it continues to, because of his grace, God continues to accept us. First John chapter 1, verse 7. He says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What is that? Well, that's grace upon grace. That's a continuance of grace. Jesus put flesh and blood on the pen and ink principle of what grace is. If you want to know what grace is, if you want to know how to define grace, if you want to know how to wrap your mind around grace, think of Jesus Christ. He is grace, full of grace, the person of Christ. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Well, it appeared in the form of, in the person of, Jesus Christ, that is what grace is. Through the life that he lived, through the words that he's spoken, we find that grace, Jesus, full of grace. So, if all that's true, then why? Why is it that when we have discussions about grace, that we become uncomfortable? Why is that? Having seen all of those passages, recognized the text, seen what Jesus is, when we talk about grace, we become uncomfortable. And I just want to say to you this morning that that ought not to be. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's an amazing verse. It's a wonderful verse. It's a hope-giving verse. But the fact of the matter is, when we read that verse, we want to put qualifiers on that verse. We want to take that verse and say, now, that's right, here's how it reads. By grace you have been saved through faith. However, that doesn't mean that you don't do anything. That because you must repent and be baptized to be saved. And we begin to get uncomfortable with that. We don't like that, so we put those, what's it, those asterisks there. And you need to read a little bit more about what it takes to be saved. And you need to know a little bit more, that footnote there, about repentance and about baptism and about obedience and all of those things. You need to know that. You just can't take that verse like that. And I really look at that verse and I wonder, is that the best approach to that verse? I, I, I look at it and I think, do you think God would have written it another way or do you think that God might have written it this way for a purpose and for a reason? And I look at it and I just think, can't we let this verse stand on the merit or on its own merit the way God intended for that verse to stand? Can't we do that in God's wisdom? 
By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Do I believe that baptism is essential for salvation? Absolutely, without a doubt. There's no doubt about it. We know that. But this verse in chapter 2, verse 8, by grace you have been saved, all right, this verse, it says that not you and not I, you cannot save yourself. You can't do it. That's what this verse is saying. You cannot save yourself. Salvation requires divine intervention, all right? So if that's true, why does this verse scare us sometimes the way it does? Well, I contend to you that it scares us sometimes the way it does because there have been a lot of folks that take this verse and twist it to mean that something that, that God never intended for it to mean. Sometimes individuals take this verse and, and they try to put words in God's mouth. And I think that's why we're all tight about it. But, but they'll talk about grace as if there's no obligation whatsoever. That because now we have grace, that we have no obligation to any law, especially the Old Testament law, that law that we had to live perfect, we were under obligation, the perfect law that God gave. And so that law sort of put God in our debt. And we certainly know that that's, that's not true anymore. But none of us will ever be able to do that. But certainly grace does not obli or, or nullify our obligation before God. We know that. James says this, chapter 1, that no one, verse 25, looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein. There's a law of liberty for the Christians. No one looks at it and in being a forgetful hearer of that law, but he's a doer of that law. That's what James says. He says this one will be blessed. So grace without obligation, that's not what this verse is teaching at all. We recognize that. Sometimes this verse is talked about, about grace without godliness. You know, that is because I'm under this wonderful grace of Jesus Christ that I'm going to be able to do whatever I want to do, any, how I want to do it. I want to live my life however I want to live it because after all, we have this wonderful grace now of Jesus Christ. Well, it was a week or two ago, I was a deep sea fishing and I said something about a roller coaster. I'll tell you what, I love, I, I'll bring it out. Let, let's go to Cedar Point. And, and the, I like going from zero to 60 in three seconds, that little car could do it in four and a half. Zero to 60 in three, you do the loop to loop, and, and then those, those rides where you go up a thousand feet and they drop you and then bring you back up and drop you, I like those things because when that happens, I raise my arms up because I like to feel that surge that I'm going to die, and I know that that bar's there and it's going to catch me. I can feel the gravity. I like feeling that, that the adrenaline, I guess, adrenaline junkie. And I like that, but I know after that ride is over with, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk safely away no matter what happens on that ride. Then I'll go down to Gilmer School and get on a swing and I'll get sick. But, but I know I'll be safe. Now, a lot of folks, when they look at grace that way, it's wide open. I get to live my life any way I want to, raise my arms, defy whatever, and when I'm done with the ride of life, guess what? God's going to save me. No matter what I do, no matter how I act, God's going to save me. People look at grace that way. Well, what would Paul say about it? Brock scripture reading, chapter 6, verse 15. What shall we say then? Shall grace abound? God forbid, he says. God forbids that. All right, and forbidding that, he condemns that. The Hebrew writer, chapter 10, verse 26. If we, and he's talking about Christians, if we, Sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for our sin. What's left? But only a certain fearful expectation of judgment. So, some use Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, talk about grace without any responsibility. That's not what he's talking about. This view of grace, I think it fails. It fails to see the connection between grace and and obedience to God. It forgets that Christ was full of grace, and this grace was manifested in him. Yet, as John pointed out in class this morning, he learned obedience. He was full of grace, yet he learned obedience, and we too. We become, or the Lord becomes, the author of our salvation to who? To all those that obey him. We need to recognize that no matter what this grace means, that there's an obligation of obedience. 
Grace is not freedom to sin. It is not freedom to have spiritual rebellion. That's not what grace is. And grace is not a substitute for genuine repentance. All right? I think some of us use the verse there to, to speak about grace. And I want to say without grace. You know, there can be recipients of God's grace. And, and, and I can't imagine, but there are some people that it doesn't bother a minute that there's a hospital down the road named Grace. And, and that, that's about all that, that there is, that, that hospital named Grace. And the lady down the street named Grace. And you, you see people like that, but, but they have never shared that grace, all right? They've been given grace, but they've never shared grace. I've heard preachers say that God pours it in you so that you can pour it out into others, the same grace that you received. Selfish grace is never what God had in mind. Do you show others grace? In the mountain message when the Lord was saying what kind of citizens should be in this kingdom, this church. Chapter 5 verse 7 he says, Blessed are the merciful for they, and they alone is in the inference there, they alone shall obtain mercy. James says he, I think it's chapter 2, he shall have judgment without mercy is the guy that doesn't show any mercy. So grace without grace, and I think sometimes that's why we're so afraid of that, that text, Ephesians 2.8. Notice what he says. By grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, he says, so that no one can boast. What's that? You and I can never, ever save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. It took and it takes divine intervention. You know, once we grasp that, I believe once we grasp that, it will change your life. Once you understand that, it will change how you live. Ephesians 2 begins by saying who we once were. And he sort of makes a U-turn as he goes through the chapter and he begins discussing about uh, God's love and his grace and the forgiveness of God. Notice chapter, or verse 19. Notice what he says. <clears throat> so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, he says, but you are fellow citizens with the saints that are God's household. Having been built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself is being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitly joined together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom, he says again, you are being built together into a dwelling of God, he says, in the Spirit. Simple phrase there in the beginning there, now therefore you are, or so then he talks about you are. Now if you follow the argument or look at the reasoning from verse 1 to verse 22 in that chapter, Paul is saying that you need to see yourself this way. Do you see yourself this way. If you see yourself as a recipient of God's grace, it will change your life. It will change the way you treat others. It will change the way you do life. When you realize, when you realize what it is that God has done for you through grace, that's when it will change you. So, what's God done for you? What's God done for you in his grace? Well, I think the crutch of the text in Ephesians 2, 8 is, the, is salvation. God, through his grace, has offered salvation. You know, I wonder sometimes if it could be that we sang the songs over and over and over and over. We sang amazing grace over and over. How sweet the sound. It's just sweet, isn't it? That sweet sound. What that sweet sound do? Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Are we numb to the words? There's amazing words in that verse. And I'll tell you what, it describes the grace of God, the salvation that's found in the grace of God. Lost, found, blind, see, was a wretch. And we sing the songs over, do they go in? Sometimes I think we're numb to them. God's grace is not about your happiness. God's grace is about salvation. God's grace is not about you finding the perfect mate. God's grace isn't about you finding the perfect job. 
God's grace is about salvation. That's what God's grace is about. And if we're left up to ourselves, what's he say? We're in trouble. Look at the words. It is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. There's a sense that can be said that in our obedience, we are saved because of what we do for God in our obedience, no doubt. But you know what, really, I think, in a much larger sense, this grace, we are saved in spite of what we have done. In spite of what we do, we have done in our life. Notice he says, chapter 2, verse 1. He says this, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. All right? Dead in trespasses and sins. Why? In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience among them, he says, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging in desires of the flesh and the mind. He says, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Well, we walked according to disobedience. We were dead in our sins. And just like the children of wrath, even those that were not part of the family of God, but God, who was what? Look at verse four. Rich in mercy because of what? His great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace. He says, you have been saved. Grace, grace acknowledges that you will never, ever be able to save yourself. That's the impact of this passage. Never be able to put God in your debt. We'll never be able to say, you know, God, I... I got the deal figured out. I I got it now. I I think, you know, I've been to church a few times. I, I know the deal. I know that Jesus came to this earth, lived, died, resurrected. Now he's in heaven. And I'm gonna come to church. I'm gonna sing the songs. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna study a little bit. And I'm gonna do all of those things. And you know what? When it's all over, we're gonna be even. You and I, God, we're gonna be even because I've done these things. And we we think that way. And I'll tell you, it doesn't work that way. Bible teacher once said that uh, salvation is a 50-50 proposition. You do half, God will do his half. That couldn't be farther from the truth. You never do half. You'll never do half of what God expects you to do. You'll never do half of what you should do to be saved. That's a far cry. We will never be able, never be able to create a, a master list of duties. And we're going to check all these off. And we're going to do all these things. And when we get done, we can look up and say, well, God owes me. When I'm done now, God will owe me. That's that's how it works. No, that's not how it works. That is not how it works. By grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast. You're never going to be able to say, God, you owe me. You're in debt to me now, God. I got the checklist out. I did her all. I like what Titus says. Paul, he saved us, verse, chapter 3, verse 5. Not on the basis of these which we have done in righteousness, not what you've done in righteousness, but what? According to his mercy. God's grace offers you salvation. God's grace offers us adoption. And I think that's mighty important. He says in verse 18, for through him we both, whether you're Jew or Gentile is what Paul's talking about, have our access in one spirit to the Father. I love the passage in Galatians chapter four. You are no longer a slave, you are a child. A son, he says. And if a son, then an heir through God. And you know what? That's mighty important. God's grace adopted his family. You know, no matter what, if you're a slave, you're always going to be a slave. Do you know that? No, you had no rights into the family. It didn't matter how good of a slave you were. It didn't matter how much the master loved you as a Hebrew, as a Hebrew slave to Hebrew master. You could never claim heirship to the family. You could not do it. And As a child, that relationship with the father would be totally different. 
It would be totally different. The patriarch of the family, that child, that relationship that you have with the child would be, would be a lot different because of that adoption. You know, early on when a child first makes the noise, you know what the Jew, the child of the Jew, ba, abba, abba, dad, father. From the very beginning, abba, father, dad, father, I need you. I'm in that relationship with you. Jesus taught that about us, that we could go to the Father, cry out, Abba, Abba, Father. That's what those words are for. A child can do that, and a child that is rightful heir to the Father's estate can do that. Notice what he says in Ephesians 1. Why did he do that? I wonder why he did that sometimes. I think he's seen potential in all of us. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, just as he has chosen us for him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. <clears throat> he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind, he says, intention of his will. Adoption. It's there. Paul says God looked at the human condition. And you know what? I think God said we can do better. We can do better. God had confidence in us, enough to preordain that he would adopt us as his own children. You know, I look at grace and I think also that his grace offers us rejection. You know, I, don't, I know that that doesn't sound right, but I don't want us to miss the point. Grace frees us. Grace frees us not to serve no master, but to serve a new master. Grace frees us not to serve no master, but to serve a new master. Now, I know that there's, uh, to the English people out there, I know that there's too many negatives in there. But I don't want us to miss the point there. God's grace does not free us to where we no longer serve any master, all right, who we have allegiance, who we have obligations to, who we submit to. That's not what free grace is all about. But it frees us to serve a new master. In the scripture reading, and what he says, Paul says, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is that you're going to serve somebody. You are going to serve somebody. That's the bad news. And really, or something. So, and Peter says the same thing. The Lord says that you can't serve two masters. And I look at all that, look what Paul said, look what the Lord says, but I don't know if that's the actual wording. It isn't that you get to choose to serve it is that you must choose who you're going to serve. You have to make a choice to do that. I don't know if any of you remember the, uh, it's been a while now, but Baby M, the controversy, the legal matter over a woman that was, uh, that Baby M was the name given to the little girl that was being carried by a surrogate mother. She was having a child for another couple. But as the pregnancy went on, she decided that she was not going to give up the child. And, of course, you might imagine, I remember the big legal dispute over that. And uh, baby M, Sarah Elizabeth Stern was her name. She was two years old when the judge from Michigan decided she's going to go home with the parents that she was promised. But for two years, she lived with her birth mother. And you might imagine the child did not have a choice. And the mother did not have a choice. This is how it worked out. And the child went kicking and screaming, upset. She did not want to leave that home. Do you know that the judge of heaven and earth could have said, you will. You will serve me. Or you won't serve me. He could have done that. Our heavenly father could have done that. He could have not given us a choice in the matter. What we commonly call free will. Paul wrote to the Romans and said, you have been set free from sin. And you voluntarily become a slave. Why would, why would you want to do that? Why would anybody become a slave? And the answer is because of the master. And a Hebrew master could treat the slave the greatest. And you know what? That slave could know and stay. Listen, I'm staying. Because I know that, the, that my master has my best interest in mind. And I know that I'll be all right as long as I serve him and have that desire to serve him. That's why you would volunteer as a slave. Paul's argument in Romans 6 is, 
Why in the world would anybody want to go back to the other slave, the other place? Because to do that, he says, that's just like an act of death. When the Lord raised Lazarus in John 11, he'd been dead long enough that the stench of death was on his clothes and on his body, and he began to decay. And the point was, when the Lord said, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came forth, well, remember what the Lord said? He said, hey, he said, get them grave clothes off of him. And you kind of can picture Lazarus coming out of the tomb and the grave clothes and wrapping, stumbling around. Lazarus didn't say, hey, wait a minute, I... I'm liking the smell of these grave clothes. I think I'm going to leave them on for a day or two. No, he wanted the stench of death off of him. That's what he wanted. And, and I think, about, think about that. That makes about as much sense as someone that's serving God, that has decided voluntarily to be the Lord's slave and God is his master, to return to immorality, to return to sin, to live in sin, I'm going to go back there. That's Paul's point. Well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbids that. God condemns that. Ephesians 2.22, In whom in Jesus you are built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's an amazing statement. Because God's grace were allowed to become, because of that, a dwelling place for him. Imagine those words. Here's the question. How comfortable is God in your temple? How comfortable is God in your dwelling place? If the elders came to you as you went out the door and said, hey, we got a visitor today. He's going to stay home with you a week. It's Jesus. You take Jesus home with you a week. Next week we'll put him in somebody else's house. How comfortable would he be at your house? How comfortable would he be in you? Would you have to make any changes? Would you have to make any changes in your life, in your marriage, in how you treat your wife, your husband, your kids? Would you have to make any changes about how you talk, how your attitude is, how your spirit is? Would, would you have to make any changes if the Lord lived in your temple this week? I guess maybe the real question is, is can God Almighty hear the heart of His Son beating in your life? Can God Almighty hear the heart of His Son beating in your life? Well, I look at Paul's words. Paul says that you are to make sure that you do not receive this grace in vain. Please get your songbooks out. The invitation is this. The grace of God has been manifested through Jesus Christ. He has given us life, eternal life. He has given us the opportunity to choose to serve Him. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Do you realize how much grace is in that statement? Do you realize how much favor, unmerited favor is in that statement? Do you realize what it took the Lord to do in order to make that statement or in order for you to hear that statement? If you're outside of Christ, you're lost. Please come. As together we stand and sing. <clears throat>